It is such an honour to be with you tonight. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. I know you're not really here for me as much as you're here for your worship and what you normally do, but I'm going to just pretend for a few minutes that you're here for me and, and I'll feel really special. Um, now, Pastor Rob mentioned that on Monday night I'll be talking about just the, the I, think, I think the word was my normal parenting workshop. It's not normal, it's awesome. It's going to be really, really good, okay? Uh, but it is not religious, um, it's, it's completely secular, it's based only on science. Tonight, I want to share with you some things that I think will make a big difference in your family from a faith basis. And I hope that you get a lot out of it. I want you to know, though, that the most important words that you hear tonight, are gonna, uh, they're not going to be the words that I say. The, the most important words that you hear tonight will be the, the quiet, soft words that God's Holy Spirit whispers to you, into your heart, as I share a message that I, I pray has come from Him for you. You, you know this. In, in John chapter 14, verse 26, we learn that the Comforter, God's Spirit, will teach us and bring things to our remembrance that Jesus has taught us. I'm hopeful that tonight his spirit will bring his words to your remembrance through me. So, thank you. Let's, um, let's get started. As Christians, we should be the best parents on earth because we have God's word to guide us. Now, I have some bad news for you. When we look at research on religious people versus non-religious people. Unfortunately, the research tells us that we're no different to them. We claim to be his disciples. We claim that he is our model for living and for all of our relationships and our interactions. But unfortunately, the research shows that we're doing parenting like every other parent out there. We've got inspired prophets and apostles who are telling us how to do this stuff. And yet, I'm not sure if we're listening when we read his word, if we're actually doing that. So my opening claim tonight is kind of a bit provocative. And that is that our typical parenting reactions to our children's challenging behaviours are, um, <clears throat> well, they make us enemies to our children. And they make us enemies to God's spirit. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, oh, can I just get an idea of how many of you are actually parents? Excellent. Okay, so almost all of you will know exactly what I'm talking here about here. And if you're a brother or a sister, you've been in this situation. Or if you're a son or a daughter. Picture this. Imagine you're a parent. What do you normally think? Or what do you normally want to do? Or, or what do you normally do when your children start ignoring you? What do you normally do when... I, I, I've, I've heard this one before from... Um, I've got six kids. You hear one of the kids say, I can't stand it anymore. What, what's the matter? She's breathing my air. <laughs> or, you know, they get the sticky tape and they say, this is my side and this is her side. She came on my side. I had this one recently. One of my daughters came to me sobbing, <laughs> just over the top. And I said, what's the matter, Annie? He said, it was my sister. And I said, what, what happened? What did she do? She said, she pointed at me. <laughs> she pointed at me. She pointed at me. What do we do? What are our typical reactions when they back chat? What are our typical reactions when they don't listen to our, our requests? Or when they won't get off the computer or the TV? Or when they won't tidy their room or pick up their bag? Or when they won't eat their food? If you're like most parents you would naturally look at your child and say, ah, let's have a little chat. Let's spend some time together. Let's hug. Not. <laughs> you probably do what most parents do. You yell, you threaten, you withdraw privileges. You send them to their room for however many years old they are plus one. You know, the naughty chair or the naughty corner or the naughty room or the whatever. And we send them away. And we push them away from us. And, and unfortunately, some parents even hit their children when they're that annoyed and they're that frustrated because they can't take it anymore. Or we say things like, stop it now, or you just wait until your father gets home. I think that's interesting as well, by the way, because we've heard tonight that our Heavenly Father is a good, good Father. And our children will often see in God what they see in their fathers. 
And if they're frightened of us coming home, how are they going to feel about going home to their God? Okay, so how does it work out, by the way? Oh, is it, can, I, can I grab a chair just quickly? Andrew, can you bring me my, my, just my chair or any chair? I just need a chair for one moment because I want to, I want to do a little demonstration. Oh, they're stuck together. Don't worry. No, no please don't. I'll just sit, on, I'll sit over here. Don't do it. You've done it. You're, he's a good man, isn't he? He's a good man. Going above and beyond. Thank you. Okay. Let's do a demonstration, okay? Let's say you have a, a teenager who doesn't do the right thing. They're 13 years old and you say, that's it, I've had enough of you. You go to your room and you think about what you've done. Because that's a pretty typical parenting response, right? So they go to their room and they sit down on their bed or at their desk and they sit there and they think, well, mum's right. I've been an impediment to our family's well-being for a few days, actually. And um, I do need to be nicer to my sister. My sister's a good person and, and I'm just misunderstanding her. And I know that when I leave my room that our family's going to be... Said no teenager ever. You know what they do? You send them to their room. This may have happened to you. And they go into their room and they sit down on that chair. And they rock backwards and forwards. And they seethe a little bit. And then they say... I hate my dad. And as soon as he, he said, if I ever catch you doing that again, so help me. But I'll tell you what, he'll never catch me doing that again. I'll be much smarter next time. <laughs> and then they sit there and they think, and my sister is toast when mum and dad aren't looking. I'm going to get him. And, and this is what we do. Thank you. That was all I needed the prop for, but I appreciate it. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> now, what does that do to our family when we do that sort of stuff? And perhaps more importantly, what are the results overall in terms of our relationship with our child when this is the way that we treat them? Well, it's Father's Day tomorrow. And so I thought that it would be appropriate since I've been invited to be here to talk about fathers and fatherhood and parenting in general, that we should look to the one who is the perfect father. That we should look to the one who can teach us all things. What can we learn from him? Pastor Rob mentioned earlier that I used to be a radio announcer. Uh, I, I left high school and got into the radio biz. And some of you would listen to a radio station here in Melbourne called 101.9 The Fox. Well, I worked for their sister station in Brisbane. At the time, it was one of the biggest and best radio stations in the country. And I don't want to sound like I've got a big head or anything because I don't do it anymore, but I was one of the best radio announcers in the country. And my days were spent hanging around with people like John Mayer and, um, I know, I know, John Mayer and um, Gwen Stefani from No Doubt and um, backstage with Ronan Keating and Beyonce, people like that. That was my life. And I would go to the restaurants and have dinner with these sort of people and hang out with the, the music reps from the big record companies. And I thought I had kind of got it made. I'd spent about a decade in that industry. But I noticed something about myself. I discovered it in an unfortunate way. I had two children at that point, and one of them was about three and a half, and I was a pretty normal dad. I had no idea how to be a parent. My wife was a little better than me. She had some early childhood training, but I had no idea. And so what happened was one day, oh, I, I, I hate telling this story, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. One day, I got home from work. It was a Saturday. I had to do the morning shift from six till midday. That meant that I had to be awake at about five so that I could be at the radio station and sound like I was happy to be there at six o'clock when I was on air. And I'd had a big Friday night the night before because radio announcers have big Friday nights. We have good social lives. And um, so I was exhausted when I got home that afternoon. And Kylie said to me, honey, I just got to go out Abby's asleep. Chanel, who was three and a half, she's, and the, ba the baby was a baby. Um, Chanel, she's three and a half. Uh, you've got her. She should go to sleep in about half an hour as well for her daytime nap. Uh, I'll be about an hour, hour and a half. You'll be right, won't you? And I said, of course I will. And I tried to put Chanel down half an hour later. And you know what happens when your toddler won't go to sleep? And, and have you ever done this? You say, listen, just go to sleep. And have you ever seen a toddler say, okay. <laughs> now that you mention it, that's probably a good idea. And she didn't do that. She started to drive me insane. And, and, and to make a, a sort of a long story short, I did all the stuff that you're not supposed to do. And the more I did that, you know, like you look at a child and you say, would you just calm down? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. 
up goes the emotion. They don't calm down. They just get worse and worse. And so that's what I was doing to my poor little three-and-a-half-year-old until I got so fed up that I smacked her. And that just made her scream more. And I was surprised by that. <laughs> and eventually, I was so sick and tired of her and my inability to cope that I treated her awfully badly and I picked her up and I threw her into her room. I aimed at the bed and I got the bed so it was okay. But that's how terribly badly I treated her. And after I'd done that and I held the door closed while she kicked and screamed and tried to get out until she fell exhausted on the floor and went to sleep, I stood there thinking, you are just so wrong. And we've all, well, hopefully we all haven't done that, but we've all had terrible parenting moments. And I walked out into the backyard just to try to settle myself and to pray for help. And as I walked out into the backyard, I heard across the back fence and down the street somewhere, a father sounding just like me, absolutely screaming at a toddler who was hollering, just going, going off. And I thought to myself, that is just what I did. That is just what I sounded like. And that is just so wrong. I've got to do something about this. And so I quit my job as a radio announcer. And for the next eight and a half years, I studied full time while we paid off a mortgage and had our third and then our fourth and then our fifth and then our sixth children. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and, and you know what? It's the greatest blessing in my life other than my faith in Christ. I wouldn't have a family had I not made that change. I don't think that my wife would have hung around with a guy that treated his kids like that for a long time. I think it would have been a bad decision. So I want to share with you some interesting thoughts that I've had as I've pondered parenting because it occurred to me that when we are behaving not even that badly, but just the way that we've been talking about tonight, you know, the typical parenting responses, you know what we do is we kind of say to God, I got this. I don't need your spirit right now. I don't need your guidance. I'm under control. I'm going to deal with this one. What do you think? And, and away we go. And we kick his spirit out at the time that we need it the most. Let's open up Galatians, if you've got your, your Bible with you. Galatians 5 and 22. You probably know this one pretty well. You've probably got it memorised. But I think that it's worth looking at. I'll give you a second to find that. Here's what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, when you think about the yelling, the threatening, the withdrawing of privileges, the sending them to their room, the hitting, do you see a whole lot of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control there? I don't. Let's go back a couple of verses to verse 16. Is what Paul says. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. We get cranky at the kids for doing whatever they want, and then what do we do? Whatever we want. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And I'm going to summarize here because not all of them are relevant to our discussion today. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And can I add to Paul, those who live like this will not inherit happy families. It seems that we struggle with this, though, when our children are challenging us. At the very time that they need us the most, and at the very time that we need God's help the most, we turn away from them, or turn against them, and we turn away from God, or we turn against Him. And we just do whatever we want. And that's a problem because we need the Spirit of God in our lives. I believe that the most important ability that we can acquire in this life is the ability to qualify for, receive and act on his inspiration, on his guidance. I don't think that there's anything more important, particularly when it comes to our children. When you're on a road, someone cuts you off and, they express their, and you express your displeasure at them. <clears throat> You've had that happen. We're in Melbourne, right? <laughs> I know that I have that happen when I drive in Melbourne. The whole hook turn thing, the whole trams. Anyway, when, when you express your displeasure, and I'm sure that most of you don't because you're wonderfully enlightened human beings who would never get angry if somebody accidentally cut you off on the road. 
Have you ever had a driver calmly pull over, pull down their window, wave to you and say, thank you. I really appreciate you pointing out that I'm an, ad- an inadequate driver. And because you've helped me to understand that, I'm going to take public transport for the next few weeks and, <laughs> and do some remedial driving lessons. What about your kids? When we point out their deficits, when we tell them how bad they're being, how much they're getting it wrong, when we point out their weaknesses and their struggles and their foibles, do they look at us and say, oh, thanks. Thanks for helping me to see where I can improve parents. I'm so grateful to you. Typically, we get the opposite response. We get defensiveness and we get anger. And I, I'm of the belief that contention and anger destroy God's spirit. I think that that's not what he wants from us. He wants love, joy, peace, forbearance, self-control. He wants something very different. Have a listen to this. We should set an example for our children to imitate. Do you believe that? Do you think that our children follow us? I think they do. And if we're yelling and threatening and doing all that sort of stuff, you know what they do? Research tells us pretty clearly that they go to school or they go down to the local playground and they copy us with whoever's smaller. We actually bully our kids and they learn that whoever's the biggest can make other people do what they want. So how often do we see parents demand obedience, good behaviour, kind words, pleasant looks and a sweet voice from their children when they themselves are full of bitterness and scolding? How inconsistent and unreasonable is this? Okay, that's the first point that I wanted to make. We need God's spirit as we parent. Otherwise, we'll get it wrong. Here's the second point I want to make. And this is a Father's Day scripture from Paul. Again, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Now, I'm flicking between the NIV and the King James Version. This one comes from the King James Version. But if you've got Ephesians 6 and 4, you'll notice that there's just a slight difference. In the King James, it says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, I like those two words. That's quite interesting. I think in the NIV, it says to bring them up in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. Is that what it says in the NIV? Is that Training. Training and instruction. Okay. And in the American Standard, it says the discipline and instruction. I'm pretty sure that's the way it goes. So what does it mean to nurture a child? Because I believe that nurture and admonition are essential in God's method of raising children. And this is what one of his apostles has told us to do. What does it mean to nurture a child? It means, if you look it up, to protect, to support, to encourage. Do you want me to say that again? Protect, support, encourage. That's nurture. Protect, support, encourage. That sounds nice. That sounds safe, doesn't it? And admonition, if you look that one up in the dictionary, it says gentle or friendly reproof. In Merriam-Webster's dictionary, it says that. And as a second definition, counsel or warning against fault or oversight. I always thought admonish meant, what are you doing? I'm going to admonish you now. You did the wrong thing. What's going on? But if you read the the definition of the dictionary, it says counsel or warning against fault or oversight, gentle or friendly reproof. Gentle, friendly. I like those words. So when the Lord speaks of admonition, I've written this here. I think he means to counsel, guide, advise and caution our children. It's our job as parents to help our children be aware of dangers along the mortal journey. It's also our job to help them be equipped with faith, with hope and love for the journey. We want them to love this journey. And they won't love the journey if they feel like they're just always getting in trouble. Now, it is a doctrinal imperative that we teach our children, that we discipline our children, that we socialise our children. The Bible makes that clear. And some people get a little bit annoyed at me when I'm giving a talk like this. And they say, well, what about the scripture where it says, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child? Can anyone find that for me? I don't think you can because it's not a scripture. It's not actually in the Bible. I don't know if anybody in this room has come across that before or not, but I always thought that was a scripture. And one day I tried to look it up when I became a parenting expert and I thought people, especially Christians, love to tell me that it's okay to smack your children because the Bible says, spare the rod, spoil the child. Well, here's what it actually says in Proverbs 13, 24. If we spare the rod, we hate our son. 
But if we love our son, we will chasten him from time to time. Now, I got really interested in that. I thought, well, what does it mean, spare the rod, hate our son? Everyone thinks that rod, you know, you hit people with a rod, right? I did some research. And the word rod in this particular psalm comes from the word shebet, S-H-E-B-E-T. And if you look up shebet, the shebet rod is the kind of rod that a shepherd uses. Now, what does a shepherd use a rod for? Does he use it to beat his sheep? To gather and to guide. I love that. And so the good shepherd does not beat his sheep. The good shepherd guides his sheep and that's what he uses his rod for. What we're supposed to do is we're supposed to guide. And it says chasten. Let's go back to admonish, gentle or friendly reproof. I like what Paul says. I think that there's value in that. I think that that's important. And particularly, did you note who that verse was addressed to in Ephesians 6, 4? Who's it to? And ye fathers. And ye fathers. Nurture them and admonish them. Use your rod to keep them on the straight and narrow. Guide them. But don't beat them. And don't use the scriptures as a terribly bad excuse. Uh, In fact, I found this. It was written by somebody. I don't know who said this. No, I crossed it out. It's not there anymore. I I did find it and now I've lost it again. But essentially, there's been entire parenting philosophies, especially among Christians, that have been used based on a couple of flimsy verses and loose translations to argue that we should be hitting our children. In fact, there is a religious leader in the United States who's written an entire book about how we should be using PVC piping to hit our children. And he's using those scriptures in his religious book as a Christian to justify hitting children with PVC piping. So that that was a bit of a downer. Sorry, I didn't mean to share that with you (laughs) in a negative way anyway. So when you're busy and things are going a little bit crazy. It's a kind of a typical reaction to go a little bit crazy too. It's really hard. I'm I'm, I'm setting up the ideal here. This is what we've been instructed to do. But remember this, our children need our help, not our punishment. And we should remember what discipline means. Discipline comes from the word disciple. And disciple in the Latin, disciplus means one who follows. What do we want our children to follow? Anger, frustration, horrible chastisement, punishment? Or do we want our children to follow love, joy, peace, nurture, admonition? It's interesting because when you raise your children, you're essentially raising your grandchildren. Whatever you do to your children, they will do to the grandkids. And here's the scary thing. Grandparents always get frustrated when they watch their kids get cranky at the grandkids. Grand, grandkids always say, oh, just be gentle. Just be. It's almost like we get a bit older and we calm down and we go, I really worried about a lot of stuff that I didn't need to worry about and I really overreacted and I was, out of, I was disproportionate. Stay nice and calm. I have a mantra to help me to remember Galatians, by the way, and to help me to remember Ephesians. Calm and kind. Calm and kind. That's what I say when my kids are driving me insane, <laughs> which happens most hours. Uh, <laughs> Calm and kind, calm and kind. Okay, I want to share with you a situation. got a phone call from a father on the Sunshine Coast. He said, I need some parenting coaching. Actually, his wife contacted me. My husband and I need some parenting coaching. We really need some help. And then she explained to me a pretty horrible situation. Their 15-year-old daughter had given dad some pretty serious attitude. It had been going on for weeks and weeks and weeks. It was building, 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 building. You know how that happens. And finally, 15-year-old girl gave dad a spray and dad got violent. And he grabbed her and he pushed her against the wall and he threatened her and he blew up at her and he went nuts. And what do 15-year-old girls do when dad does something like that? She was gone. She ran. She was out. And she came home a few days later. They had no idea where she'd been. They didn't know what had gone on, but they had no way of contacting her. And they rang me and they said, she's home, but she's not talking and she absolutely refuses to be in the same room as her father and we need help. I said, fantastic, let's talk about this. Now, it was interesting because I'll use the chair again, Andrew, because it's there. When I Skyped into their living room or their study or whatever it was, mum was sitting at the computer desk like this. 
and she had the pen and paper ready and she wanted to know how to fix things. Dad was sitting in the other chair in what I call the I dare you to teach me position. (laughs) Come on, what have you really got? So we started to talk about things and he essentially said, it's not my fault. She provoked me. She did the wrong thing. It's all her fault. And I'm not going to even try to make things better until she apologises to me. And I'm thinking, this may not go very well today. This could be a tough, a tough audience. Let's look closely at this situation and apply some scripture to it. What was the teenager doing? She was giving bad attitude. So how does dad see her as a bratty, nasty little piece of work who thinks she's an adult, but she's only a 15-year-old kid and she needs to learn some respect? So how does dad behave? Angry. He treats her with disdain and disrespect because she's doing the same to him. And what does she feel? Anger, bitterness, resentment, hatred, a loss of self-control. So how does she act? Like a little brat. And how does he feel? Horrible and angry. And so do you see where I'm going here? What what do you call this? It's a vicious circle. And that's what... (laughs) I saved that one for you, Rob. (laughs) That was punny, wasn't it? Mm. Okay. I actually had a list that I was going to share, but I decided that it wasn't the right thing. Uh, So anyway... Whose fault is it? Whose fault is this? Is it the daughter's fault or is it dad's fault? The dad's fault. Can I get a show of hands? Who thinks it's dad's fault? About about a third of you. Who thinks it's the daughter's fault? About three of you. (laughs) Who, Who thinks it's both of their fault? I think it's both of their fault. When you get into a vicious circle, it just takes one person to cut it. Just one, one person to forgive, one person to be the bigger man. Now, if I'm talking to dad, who should the bigger man be? The 15-year-old girl or dad? I think so. I think it should be dad as well. Um, There are two people in most exchanges between parent and child, a parent and a child, an adult and a child. The child is acting like a child. What are you going to act like? (laughs) <laughs> You're so kind to me. Rob, Pastor Rob's sitting in the front row, if you can't hear it at the back, and he's just going, yeah. <laughs> I, it's wonderfully affirming. You should come to all of my seminars. <laughs> so who has the problem? Matthew 7, Matthew 7, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus. Let's hear from him. I think that he should have an important word here. Matthew 7, 3 through 5. You know this one. You know it well. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, and can we substitute the word brother to child? How can you say to your child, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your child's eye. But the problem is we all have this problem, all of us. And we actually can't get those planks out. They're there. It's part of our fallenness. And we get caught up in correction. Now, if you look carefully in the book of John, chapter 13, you'll see there that the Saviour says, this is the new commandment, that ye fix one another as I have fixed you. That you also... (laughs) Doesn't say that, does it? What does it say? That you love one another. He does not command us to fix everyone else. That's his job. He will fix us through his atonement, through his sacrifice. It's not our job to fix our kids. It's our job to guide them and to teach them the right way. But when they fall short, we don't have to get angry at them. We just guide them and we just love them. Okay. Actually, let me share one more quick story and then I'm going to go to the third point and we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, I have a friend who really... He's just a wonderful mentor to me. He lives in the United States uh, and he's a professor of family life development. Great guy. His name's Wally. (laughs) Wally Goddard. That is, yeah, where's Wally? He's in the States. And and he was... (laughs) He he was with his friend 
the neighbour, they were chatting in the garage, just having one of those great chats that you have with your neighbour when you stand in the garage and talk about nothing and they were enjoying their nothing chat. And, and next thing you know, the neighbour's little boy, five years old, Michael, comes tearing down the driveway on his bike and you know those big back brake skids, that uh, kind of skid and the wheel slid out and he jumped off the bike and dropped it in the middle of the garage and as he ran past Dad to go up the street and play with his friends, Wally's friend, the neighbour, reached out and grabbed Michael by the arm. Bang! And he pulled him back and he lifted him up over at the top of his head. Now, this guy was tall, so this little boy was about seven feet, about two metres in the air. Five years old, two metres, that's a long way. And while he was up there, this man said, how many times have I told you? If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Don't do that with your bike, it goes against the wall. And he said all that stuff that we practice saying so that we can be good parents. And then as he was giving him this spray, he looked next to him and saw Wally, Professor of Family Life Development. (laughs) And he stopped and he thought for a minute. And then he said, I love you. (laughs) And he put him on the ground. And do you think that as Michael ran in there to put his bike away, that he thought, gee, I'm so glad that even when I get things wrong, my dad loves me. I don't think so. And I don't think, that that's what God, I don't think that's what God wants us to do. I don't think that's the kind of father he needs us to be. The other day while I was travelling, and I've been on the road for a while now, and I'm a dad and I've got six daughters and I hate being away from them, I got a phone call from my wife. She said, I'm just about ready to hurt Annie. And so I've called you because I need to calm down and I need you to talk to her so that you can be the parenting expert and you can get this right because I'm not going to get it right if it keeps going. I said, that's fine. Put her on. I had a chat to Annie. She wanted to hurt her sisters. She wanted to be horrible. She's seven. She's having a hard time. I've been away for four days. I knew how she was feeling. And, and, and I, I had a couple of options. I could have said a number of things to Annie, but you know what I said? I said, Annie, you're feeling horrible today, aren't you? I said, Annie, you miss me. You wish your dad was close. And she started to cry. I said to her, you just, you just need to know how precious you are. You need to know how much I love you. You are so precious. Her name is Annie Grace. You know, Annie comes from Anna, and Anna comes from Hannah, and Hannah comes from Grace. And Grace, Grace is such a blessing. And so we, we call her Gracie Grace. And I said, my Gracie Grace, I love you. You see, I often think that we forget how much God loves us and we act in ways that show that we've forgotten. And our kids sometimes forget that we love them and they act in ways that demonstrate that they just need us to love them. And when they get that love from us, they don't need horrible, nasty correction and direction. They just need understanding and then some gentle guidance. When I got home that night after being on the road for four days, I said to my wife after I'd played with Annie, We had some fun. We play Tangled Up. It's kind of like that whole favourite leg thing. I just lay on the ground, the kids jump on me and I hold on them while they try and escape. They think it's fabulous. And um, after Annie had gone to bed, Kylie said to me, so what did you say? How did you change her behaviour so effectively? I said, I just told her that I love her. And I think that when we feel God's love, it changes us. And our children need to feel our love in the same way that we need to feel His. Let me share one more message before I finish. I'm not going to read the scripture because I'm almost out of time. We start, I started way late and I'm going to finish as close to time as I can, but I'm already a minute or two over. Go for it. Go for it. I've got permission. Okay. I've got permission from the boss. I feel grateful. Okay. Luke 15. Sorry. Let me quickly summarize. Number one, we've got to have God's spirit with us when we raise our children or we just can't do it right. Number two, we need to nurture and admonish our children. And we need to remember what nurture and admonish mean. Number three, Luke 15. I'm pretty sure you know this one really well. Luke 15, starting in verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. 
after he'd spent everything. There was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now I'm gonna interrupt myself just quickly. There's a theologian called Snodgrass and he's done a wonderful excursus on all of the parables of Jesus. Do you know Snodgrass? You, no, okay. It's a great name, isn't it? That's his last name, not his first name. You wouldn't call you, you, you wouldn't, would you? <laughs> Agricultural work in ancient Jerusalem was highly valued. Abandoning it, abandoning it was greatly disrespectful. In addition to that, disrespect to parents was con condemnable and was even imprisonable. So he was actually supposed to be disowned because of what he did. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now there's some pretty remarkable humility there knowing the seriousness of what he had done. But he went back to his father. He got up and went to his father. And we know what happened. But I want to emphasise this verse because I think verse 20 tells us more about God's goodness and what he wants from us than just about anything in the Bible. But while he was still a long way off, a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. So here we have a setting where a boy does everything to disrespect his father and his father welcomes him back. Do our children disrespect us and do we stand there with open arms? to have them back as soon as they come to their senses. This may be the most beautiful example of what God wants us to be for our own children. Now, while I was combing the internet to find something to do with this amazing parable, I came across a poem from a different perspective that explains this parable so beautifully. I wanna share it with you. It's by it's by a lady by the name of Mary Lyman Henry, and it's called To Any Have Watched for a Son's Returning. <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> he watched his son gather all the goods that were his lot, anxious to be gone from tending flocks, the dullness of the fields. He stood by the olive tree gate long after the caravan disappeared where the road climbs the hills on the far side of the valley into infinity. Through changing seasons, he spent the light in a great chair, facing the far country and that speck of road on the horizon. Mocking friends, he will not come. Whispering servants, the old man has lost his senses. A chiding son, you should not have let him go. <laughs> a grieving wife, you need rest and sleep. She covered his drooping shoulders, his calloused knees, when east winds blew chill until that day, a form familiar even at infinity, in shreds, alone, stumbling over pebbles. When he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Earlier in the week, actually, sorry, it was like, no, it was this week. I'm a bit confused with the travel. Earlier in the week, I ran a seminar for some parents of adolescents in a very underprivileged area of Sydney. And these parents were having a hard time, a very hard time. At the end of the seminar, I had a father come to me, a South American man, and he sobbed as he told me, my children are afraid of me. When they see me move my hand, they flinch because I've hit them so many times that they just expect that that will be my response. He said, you've changed my life. <clears throat> and then he said, I believe that Papa God, I loved his phrase, Papa God. Wouldn't it be great if we saw God as our Papa, not some distant eternal father, but as our close loving Papa. He said, I believe that my Papa God wants me to be the kind of father that you've taught me how to be tonight. I believe with all my heart that our Papa God 
will welcome us with open arms if we return to him. He waits. He just waits there for us, watching, watching that speck at infinity. He wants us to be with him again. He loves us. He is a good, good father. It's my prayer. It's my prayer that we will love our children the way that he has shown and the way that he has taught and his prophets and apostles have taught. That we will love our children with his spirit as our guide, with nurture and admonition and with an ever welcoming embrace. In Jesus' name, amen.